listening to the Mark Bradford Alchemy for Life podcast. An awesome chat with Scott Adams. I am here with Scott Adams. Hi, Scott. Hi. So I want to welcome you to the show. And as I usually do, I ask people what they do. And as we know, that's not who they are. So please answer in whatever order you'd like to. Well, I'm the creator of the Dilbert comic strip, but I also write books about persuasion and success and and, uh, strategies for success. And my latest one, Loser Think, is about how to think more productively. That's awesome. And I I notice that a lot of times when you are are giving interviews on shows and things, and also you have tremendous stamina for the rounds that you've been making for Loser Think. I I applaud you for that. I know it takes quite a bit of energy to do that. And it's it's actually the hardest part about the book writing process, but go ahead. Right, it's going making the rounds. Um, And it's interesting when I hear you introduced as the creator of Dilbert, though that is very true and you have a long history of doing it, I think you've also made such tremendous progress with the other things that you do. You have a daily periscope, you have articles, and you do have the books. I mean, there's a number of books that you've come out with recently, and they're all really, really interesting books. Thanks. Uh, I wonder if I will be remembered by my books that have nothing to do with Dilbert or by Dilbert. Uh, It's one of those questions I ask myself in 100 years. Will anybody remember any of it? And if they did remember any of it, would it be one of the books or something about Dilbert? I'm not sure. Well, I I guess my... My answer to that is a question to you. What do you think George Carlin would be remembered for as a comedian or as more of a philosopher? Because I would apply that to you, actually, is that I think you're going to be remembered for more more than just the comic. You'll be your your um, your talks on persuasion and cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias. All that stuff is is, I think, something that really will have a lot of impact. You know, the the Carlin uh, example is interesting. I would, I would throw Dave Chappelle in there as someone who's a comedian slash philosopher. And it's probably not an accident that people who deal with humor um, sort of drift into or overlap with philosophy, because humor is about simplification. And good philosophical writing is simplification, too. So there's there's a lot of overlap in those things. And speaking of simplification, I would say that's probably your core skill. It's probably your the thing that you do best is to take and distill something. And I, and I say that humbly as someone who's always tried to do that same thing. I found that as one of my two core skills was I like to take complex things and sort of distill it. So I recognize that. And in you, I, I recognize that quite a bit. Yeah, I do it for a living. So you, you one does get better at it. The, the whole... Uh... <laughs> cartooning thing is about condensing things to their simplest form. And then I take that uh, over to my other writing as well. So, and I would agree, I have uh, a number of talents based on hard work. In other words, I've taught myself how to draw just by doing a lot of it. You know, I taught myself how to write by doing a lot of it. But uh, the one thing that I'm not sure I learned, I probably got some tips in my childhood, but the ability to simplify might be my one natural talent. Mm-hmm. I would say I would say that comes across as something that's it's innate. And you talked about uh, a lot of talents, which of course you call the talent stack, which I read about in, in one of your other books. And I think that is such a powerful thing. It's it's really an interesting thing. Is um, and if you'd like, why don't you describe what that is? Yeah, I wrote about that in my book, How to Failed Almost Everything and Still Win Big, which has become somewhat huge even on the backlist. It's still selling like crazy. It's probably the most influential thing I'll ever do. And I introduced the idea of systems are better than goals and also the talent stack idea, which is a subset of a system. And the idea is that it's difficult to be the best in the world at anything. You know, we can't be Tiger Woods. And you probably know by the time you're six years old if you have that kind of talent. So for the rest of us, we have to try to be special within the constraints of not being amazing at anything in particular. And so the the best way to do that that's really accessible to everybody is that you just layer talents on top of each other that work well together. So for example, if you learn to do public speaking, 
that layers well with almost any other skill. So you're far more likely to get promoted to the to management if you can do public speaking, plus what the other people in your job are doing. So yeah, you know, that's just a simple and clean example. But if you take cartooning, for example, uh, I'm not a great artist to, to say the least. Uh, it, I'm barely an artist, just just barely. I don't even call myself an artist. Um, and I, I can write well, but not as great as the best writers. And I've got some business experience, which allows me to do the business of Dilbert, as well as have a, uh, a canvas to work for the, the humor. So I, I've got this weird combination of skills. I'm also a trained hypnotist and learning about how the mind works does help me decode people and, and show the silliness and the irrationality of it all. But none of them are world-class skills. It's just that they work really well together to make me uh, to make me rare. There aren't many people who have my combination of skills, but there are plenty and plenty of people who are far better at any individual skill. And when the skills are are dis- disparate and they're and they're and they're separate, they they seem to combine and, and they become more powerful versus two skills that are very similar. Well, I I think that falls under the category of it depends. Okay. Uh, because you might need those two similar skills yeah, as a base before you add the other skills. So I, so I understand the point, but I think it, every situation is different. You have, to, you have to look at what you naturally have, which is a good place to start. So you might say to yourself, you know, my one natural thing is I can outwork other people. Or my one natural thing is I'm creative or I'm a good writer or whatever it is. And then say, what would combine well with those things? And that's a good place to start. Interesting. And would you say, I found that a lot of the people that I was migrating to, people in my personal life and even people that I was fascinated to watch, I found out that I would call them dual brained because they have this good combination of like logistics and creativity at the same time. And it seemed like when that was combined, it really made for something really interesting. Yeah, and that's a pretty rare combination. Usually you don't get the, um, I hate to say left brain, right brain stuff, uh, because I don't think that's technically what's happening in your brain, but you know, it's a common reference. So yeah, um, I've got enough of the creative stuff and enough of the analytical stuff. I was an uh, economics major, I've got an MBA, and you know, I worked in finance and, and technology before I was a cartoonist. So. I'm kind of rare that I have both sides. In fact, my my SATs when I was a kid, my verbal and math were identical scores. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of rare. Yeah, and I think that, I, and I think I do. I must have a sense for that because I feel I feel that I have I've been identified as that over and over again. And then I found the people that I was attracted to seem to be the same way. So I guess in this case, it's it's my sense is still on. It is. The um one of the, uh, the thing I wanted to ask you about also and and feel free to, to to we can switch gears to the book but I think your your books talk so much about the things that you normally talk about and I think and I, whether this is just in your nature or your brilliance when it comes to marketing but you know people talk about how internet marketing is sort of backwards and where and where you don't say here I made this thing go buy it no I don't want to I don't want to tell you about it but just go buy it versus let me share with you all the stuff that you're going to get out of this and you have a periscope every day and you're very visible on Twitter as well. So you have, you have quite a bit of stuff that you share that if people read your books, they'll go, Oh yeah. Talked about that. That's that thing he was mentioning. Yeah. And a lot of that is a B testing. So I I'll oh. throw out an idea on periscope or on Twitter and I'll see if I get a lot of retweets or a lot of comments and the stuff that uh, gets the most reaction is, is what I'm likely to put in a book next time. So it's, it's not so much that I'm giving it away after I've written the book. It's a process of finding out what should be in the book. And then by the time I've written it in a book, it just becomes part of my personality. So if somebody asks me a question, it's pretty likely I'm going to say something I may have written in some book one day. Right. And, and I think it shows in just this conversation as opposed to a conversation with someone who wrote a book and they just keep going back and saying, well, in this chapter, in this chapter, as opposed <laughs> yeah. to just kind of a flow of information, which is actually really cool. Well, good. I'm glad that's working. (laughs) Glad that's working. um, You talked about your um, being a trained hypnotist and also uh, persuasion comes up a lot too in what you talk about. Yeah, persuasion 
uh, is another one of those skills like public speaking that combines well with just about everything. In fact, uh, I don't know if you could come up with any kind of a job where you wouldn't be better off if you knew the skills of persuasion, because at the very least, it would help protect you against other people persuading you, or at least you'd, <laughs> you'd be able to identify it when it's happening. Uh, but there's really no situation I can even remotely think of where being more influential on your coworkers, your customers, your boss, whoever's around, when that's not a good thing. And not just not a good thing, but it's a great thing. You know, if you're persuasive, you're going to get that promotion, all things being equal, because uh -huh. leaders need to be per, uh, persuasive. And if you're in sales, you need to be persuasive. It's, it's pretty much a universal thing that people maybe think they can do because our our common sense which is really just a myth uh leads us to believe that we can think well and that we you know we can figure stuff out without learning how to think or learning how to do that stuff but uh, sometimes those are learned skills and i think the the pendulum has swung the other way now and that it's now a job uh and you know like instagram influencers so that's literally a job now to yeah. influence and persuade people. Yeah, you know, the thing that social media did and the example of the influencers is, is maybe the, the minor example of that. But what it did is weaponize talent. So if you were influential or you had something to say or you were just smart and you could communicate well, all you need is social media and social media will discover you at a low level and promote you with retweets and, and whatnot and growing uh, followers. So suddenly people like me, who ordinarily would have no sway in any kind of a political conversation, I can have one because I bring persuasion skills and because I talk about the topic of politics, it's a, it's a real potent combination. And then the number of people on social media promote me and make my voice more prominent. Um, just by scale and suddenly I feel like I'm having an effect on stuff and almost anybody can do that now so the, the world is turned upside down from the original design of the republic where the citizens just uh, essentially elect representatives to ride off on their horses and go make some laws and run the government and let us know when you're done uh, to the government is really, I would say at this point, especially in the Trump administration, is responsive to social media. It would be hard to think of any any situation where our leaders could get away with doing something the social media overwhelmingly hated, let's say both sides. So uh, it's usually you know, right down the middle by party lines. But in if the leader tried to do something that both parties had a problem with, it just couldn't be done. I think I think you're right. The, the the microscope or the looking glass is is out there now. You, and speaking of speaking of the president, you you're quite vocal on that, and you also are definitely immersed in politics. That that shows up in your in your books, and it also shows up in your Periscope that you do every day. Yeah, my interest in per, in uh, politics is much less the policy stuff because I I confess that I'm not smart enough to know what a good trade agreement looks like. I, I don't know exactly what to do with climate change, et cetera. So my my beat, if you will, is the persuasion angle. So the way people think about it, the psychology of it, how does that make you feel? How does that make you act? So that stuff I find fascinating because it's more about humans. The political stuff is just an interesting, um, I'd say, environment to study that stuff. Right. It's, it's sort of a universal communication regardless of, of the job or, or even the status of the individual. Yeah, it only matters to me that other people find it important. <laughs> yeah, and and that's that's enough for me because if they're acting like it's important, then I study them. I don't I don't study the policy so much. And you do talk, and you talk about that in the periscope and it, it's really interesting to, to watch because and and I'm gonna I'm gonna say something, but I mean this in a very positive way because there's a negative way to take this, but you, you come across as a as a college professor sometimes and I, and that you, 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 you sort of disseminate something and then you ask a question and you say, does that make sense to you? Is that the way that that would affect you? So you really have a certain 
very neutral level of, of the way that you explain information. And you don't see that a lot because the news, as we all say, you know, there's a tremendous amount of influence going on in the news. Well, when you call it a neutral way of explaining, I would say it's a persuasive way. So um, getting people to change their own minds is always more effective than, you know, damn it, listen to my argument, change your mind. What's wrong You're with right. you? Are you just stupid? Can't you see my facts and reason? That doesn't work. People just stiffen their resistance. But if you put it in the form of a question, people can actually answer the questions and change their mind right in front of you if you do it right. Uh, but I think what you're observing, my my technique that you just mentioned of, of asking people what they thought of stuff, has a lot to do with Periscope. So for anybody who doesn't know what Periscope is, it's a streaming service owned by Twitter. So you can just take your phone and uh, you're live to the world of other Periscope users. And it's a little, little video live streaming thing. And w the way I use Periscope and what I find is the most interesting thing about it is that the comments are streaming across the screen live while I'm doing it, which gives me the sensation that I'm actually talking to people. You know, instead of just presenting to a camera, uh, I can see the people responding in real time. So I treat it more like it's a conversation where you ever go to dinner and, you know, there, there are six of you at dinner, but one of the people is really, really interesting. And so the, the other five are just like, how about we just sort of listen, listen to you? Because <laughs> you, you're, you're the only one who's got anything interesting to say today. So I try to be the, the interesting person at the dinner table, but everybody else is at the dinner table too. So I try to recognize them often. Well, but, and, and, just, and just to split hairs, the, the, sometimes the interesting person is just the one who keeps talking. And I think in your case, you actually, even though it's your Periscope, I do think you give credit where credit's due when someone comes up with something. I try to. I, I don't think I'm as good at doing that as I would like to be for my personal standards. And some of it's just sometimes you get lazy and you forget who said what. But I, I definitely try to do that. Um, I don't, it's bad form and bad strategy to try to sell someone else's idea as your own. Uh, so I try to avoid it. And you, you also give credit where credit's due regardless of which side of the argument the person is on. So you actually are able to separate if someone does something funny, even though you typically don't agree with what they say, you'll still call them out for the positive thing, which is unheard of. <laughs> People don't do that typically, especially on Twitter. Yeah, it's, it's kind of rare. Every once in a while, you'll see some pundit say, you know, that was an evil thing that person did, but they did it really well. <laughs> you know, as evil goes, it was well executed. So I try to teach people about persuasion. And to do that, there are examples uh, on the team they like and the team they don't like. And I try to use them both. The other benefit that gives me is it's a, it's a uh, technique for remaining unbiased. If you can force yourself to say something good about both teams, whatever that is, it, that helps you sort of not get locked into one team and everything your team does is brilliant and everything the other team does is, is garbage. So I, it's a mental habit, not only in that case, but similarly, whenever I have something bad to say, you know, there's some bad news or, you know, something that's just a downer. Uh, or a criticism. I try to add at least one positive thought when I'm done, to kind of cancel it out. Mm -hmm. So that's just a, a life technique. And I think that's excellent. I think what you're also touching on is the whole concept of a mental prism, right? And yes. People being in a bubble. Yeah, there, there are a variety of ways people can get locked in their bubble, but it's all about not having a productive uh, filter on life. You know, not being able to see things in a way that will help you. And you may notice that I'm wording this very carefully. I'm not saying that one is right and the other bubble is wrong because that's, that's loser thing to think that you got the right bubble. Oh, how lucky you are. Everybody else is in their own little bubble, but wow, what a coincidence that, that you're not in one. So that I try to avoid that because we're all in a bubble. It's just a different bubble. Some of us have developed through lots of hard work and practice the ability to peek inside other bubbles, but you can't really get in there. <laughs> you know, at best, at best, you can see what's happening in there from the outside. Uh, but that's that's my view of the world. Everybody's in a bubble, and some of us know it, and most of us don't. And that's what a lot of the 
where some of the book, in fact, the cover itself shows people floating around in their own bubbles. And, and you talk about that in Loser Think. And I don't know if we've defined it yet or not, but if you could define, I, I could define it, but I'd much prefer you do it, what the concept of Loser Think actually is. So Loser Think is a word I invented to try to capture the idea that there are people who might be smart within their domain, but if they haven't been ex- uh, exposed to the way people think in other domains, They may think that their common sense is enough, but in fact, learning to think productively is a a learned skill. And um, let me give you an example. Uh, I I mentioned that I have a background in economics. Now, if you study economics, you're actually taught better decision-making. You're taught what a sunk cost means. You're taught how to look at money, you know, the value of money over time and the math that you would do on that. You're taught to compare things that are relevant comparisons. Now, if you take somebody who's, let's say, the opposite, let's say they're in the arts, they're a musician or they're uh, a writer or a poet or something, in that world, they're not taught to compare things. And worse, if you're in the creative world, you think everything is connected, uh, and it may not be. So where the engineer would say, well, here's this gear and here's this gear, and they're just different, and I'll treat them differently, the, the writer is used to a world where if you're reading a book and, you know, a character picks up an expensive watch and fondles it, you're, you're safe to think that that will be important later. You know, every, everything there is a reason. There are no coincidences in literature. You know, everything's there because the writer put it there. But in the real world, we're filled with coincidence that doesn't mean anything. And you really need to separate things to analyze them properly. So it's a completely opposite skill and loser think fills in those gaps without making you learn everything about economics or everything about uh, the creative world or psychology. It's just sort of the high level thinking techniques. And you make a great statement on that too. You say that loser think is, is, is mockery, but you're not mocking the person, you're mocking the method. Yeah, so the loser think is the technique, and I'm quick to point out that I make every mistake that's in my book that I tell you you shouldn't make. Uh, but I like to think I'm decreasing it. <laughs> you know, my my rate is decreasing over time, and part of it is just being exposed to the idea that there there are better ways to think and worse ways, and and being able to call them out. So people will call me out on Twitter if I if I make the mistake of using an analogy to you know make more of a point than analogies are supposed to make or if i imagine i can imagine somebody's intentions or thoughts because i warn against that as well so one of the techniques in loser think i talk about is it's very common for us to assume we know what other people are thinking and then to take that assumption and criticize them for it for example (laughs) uh, i know the real reason you did that is to get power um, even if the thing is good, <laughs> you know, maybe it's a thing that's good for the world, but, but you'll see people say, now nah, the real reason you did that is just selfish. It's just for power. And I remind people that we can't even tell what our spouse or our girlfriends or boyfriends are thinking half the time. You know, if you've ever been in any kind of relationship, you know, half of your problems are making bad assumptions about what the other one is thinking. Mm-hmm. So what are the odds that we know what a politician that we've never met is thinking or what they're their secret inner thoughts and intentions and their priorities. We don't know. You know, sometimes it's obvious, but uh, there are many times it is not. And I caution people to take some humility on how accurate they can be uh, thinking about the inner thoughts of strangers. It's better to look at their actions because you can judge those more objectively. Right. And I think the humility is a huge part of it. And I think that's something that, that, that I think you display a lot is when you look at other people's point of view and when you do call someone out for doing something positive, it's clear that your ego is not driving you to think a certain way. And in the book, you even talk about how you give people permission to take a picture of a page (laughs) to then show it to someone because it takes a lot of the, the ego out of it and saying, see, look, in a book that was actually published, they said this, what do you think? Yeah, there, there's something about being an author who has a published book that gives you credibility. And I, I let people borrow that credibility by taking the picture of the book, as you said, and tweeting it or putting it on social media. Because there, there are many cases where, because I'm a professional communicator, 
I can just say things more clearly than than people can on their own. And of course, if it's a picture of a page, you you got a lot of text there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just make that available as a as a tool. Could come in handy, and it's especially a around Thanksgiving. <laughs> right, right, and it's a physical representation, which is almost like a talisman that you're holding up to someone versus just saying, "Well, I read X, Y, and Z." Yeah, so. It gives it unearned credibility just because it came from a book, but I like to think is right anyway, so so that shouldn't be a problem. And I do like that you also you talk about two things you talk about, and you show this on Twitter that you say this is another example of mind reading in which someone says something that almost sounds right, but then when you read it again, you think, well, yeah, they don't know that. How could they know what that person's actually intentions are? But they just yes. assume all of that. Yeah, the, the mind reading illusion is probably the most common uh, bad thinking technique. Now, it's usually done by partisans. You know, somebody somebody saying that other person in that other party is only in it for the money or whatever, whatever they imagine. Uh, and I take what I call the Dr. Laura approach. There was, uh, you may remember Dr. Laura was a, a conservative advice kind of person on the radio. And years ago, I heard her say something that just changed how I see the world permanently. Just one of these little, you know, reframings of the world. And what she said was, and I think it comes from maybe some kind of tradition, I don't know. But uh, she said that you're, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, you're not your thoughts. That's not who you are. You're, you are your actions. So it doesn't matter if you have bad thoughts, if you're doing good things in the world. You're not the bad thoughts, you're the good things. And you can actually use your actions to reprogram who you are and how you feel. So you've got some executive control about what you do with your body. You know, do you do you take it on a trip somewhere to another country where you learn some stuff? Do you take it out in the sun so you'll be in a better mood? And so I use my limited executive control in my brain over my body to put my body in situations that help help me think better. Mm-hmm. I think that's that. Those are that's one of those phrases. In fact, I'm stumbling over my words. It's so powerful. That's one of those phrases in life that you learn and you think, "Wow, that's going to stay with me." I mean, one of the things that I learned a long time ago in business was perception is everything, and that either perception is reality. And so that stuck with me for a long time. And that that sounds very similar. Something that you get that and you think, "Oh, I I can do that. That's that's cool." Yeah, here, here's another one that's sort of reminded, uh, I'm reminded of it, it's in the same vein. A lot of people want a lot of things. They want to succeed. They, they want certain things in life. But I, I, I point out that the difference between the people who get rich and the people who don't is that the people who get rich don't want something, they decide to get it. And there's a big difference between deciding to get something and wanting it. The people who want it are going to look at the price and they're going to say, yeah, well, I want it, but I don't really want it at that price. Whereas the person who simply says, I now decide, this is a decision. I'm going to, I'm going to go do this wow. thing. And then they're presented with the price and it's enormous. And that person says, doesn't matter. It's a decision. I'm going to pay that price. I'm just going to get so that. yeah, w once you realize that your wishes are useless, but your decisions are important, that fits very nicely, fits very nicely with your, not your thoughts, your, your actions. And you got to make a decision to act. Yeah, that's, that's outstanding. And you could, you could hide that whole, you could hide a discussion of that in a book called Your Wishes Are Useless. <laughs> that's not a bad idea. I might do that. <laughs> <laughs> you should do that. There actually are a number of statements in your book that jump out at me as, wow, you should call your next book that because they're, they're so well phrased. They're so, and I just, you know, I'm just in love with, with sentence structure and words and the way things are said. And you do call outs in your book, which I love in nonfiction is when, and, you know, call outs for people listening are typically when something is pulled out or pull outs, I think they're called, where you pull something out of the sentence and you make it bold or you make it jump out in a page. And that way, even if you're just flipping through the book, it's supposed to catch your attention and go, oh, that's interesting. Maybe I should actually read the book. And some of your call outs are like that, where they're like this really great, ways to phrase something and they're they're sort of one foot in a little bit of humor and one foot in in reality when it comes to what it's trying to impart i really like that thank you i i think the term is pull quotes pull quotes or, yes pull sorry quotes. yeah that's a little insider lingo there yep yeah i did that with mine the um 
I wanted to ask you if you don't mind me taking a, a 90 degree turn. You wrote a book called God's Debris. Uh-huh. And it was actually the first thing I'd, I'd read from you. I mean, I'd followed the, the I'd followed Dilbert for quite some time. And I, like hundreds of thousands of people, was convinced you worked at my company. I was immersed in a in a in a very large law firm a long time ago. And so some of the, you know, the things that were in the comics, I thought, well, okay, he's he's here somewhere. And I know you had heard that from a lot of people, but then I read God's Debris, and it was actually pretty much the first ebook I'd ever writ- read. And I think I read it in a day because it was such a fascinating thought experiment. And oh, oh go ahead. Uh, there's probably more to your question. Go ahead, Noel. Not no. much. It was sort of petering off. So I was just going to. I had a number of things I wanted to ask you about it, but if you have a response already, I'd love to hear what you have. Uh, yeah. So what made God's Debris different from anything I've done, but probably different from any book, as far as I know, is that, as I mentioned, I'm a trained hypnotist. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun to write a book where I used as much of my hypnosis technique as possible? Now, all writing uses persuasion. So, so there's no such thing as good writing that has no persuasion built into it. But I thought, what if I take it to the the next level where I'm really trying to create an experience for the reader? And the experience I try to create is that that you've uh, encountered a conversation between uh, two people, and one of them is the smartest person in the world who inexplicably knows everything about how reality works and explains it. Now, of course, since I don't know how reality works, (laughs) you know, that, that would be a big ask for an author. I use a trick to make the the reader feel as if I do, or at least feel as if the character does. And the trick is that people imagine the simplest explanation for things is right. It's known as Occam's Occam's razor. razor. And I talk about in my book that it's just an illusion. We think the simplest explanation is right because we also think our own explanation is the simplest one. So it's it's actually circular thinking. Uh, But... In the context of persuasion, it is persuasive. People think simple arguments are likely to be more accurate than explaining the same set of facts with a whole bunch of variables. So I had my smartest person in the world character explain things in the simplest terms I could think of. And when you do that, I I realized one day when I was taking a shower, before I thought about writing the book, I realized that I had all these random thoughts about reality that if you simplified them all, they fit together like a puzzle. And it was this moment I had while I was in the shower, literally, and uh, years and years of random thoughts all suddenly came together and formed a whole. The book actually wrote itself while I was standing in my shower. Mm-hmm. And I've never had that experience before. It was it was almost like, you know, if, if I were a believer, I would call it a divine experience because it it had the feeling of being just delivered, you know, from God or something. Uh, I'm not a believer, so I don't think it was delivered from God, but it was an amazing experience. And so, writing it was almost a process of typing what I what I was reading in my head. I mean, it was almost that that clean. And uh, I used my hypnosis technique, and predictably, because hypnosis has a different effect on and every every person. Some number of people say it's the best book they've ever written or ever read in their life because they just have a kind of a tingling, eye-opening, you know, brain effing kind of experience, which is, <laughs> which is how it's designed. And then other people get angry and they don't have the experience because they, they can feel the persuasion, but they don't want to be persuaded in that way. And so they, they respond with anger and, and criticism. So it's a very polarizing book. But as you said, it doesn't take long to read it. And if you if you really want to take a chance with your mental health, <laughs> no, it's not dangerous. Um, but if you but if you want to take a you know a chance that you're in that group that has a real experience with it, uh, I'd recommend that book. It's not like regular books, right? It's 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 very it's very light in the way that it, it's written. And I don't know how any other way to say that other than you just. I guess it's similar to the way that I keep describing the way that you give information and in that you don't seem like you're bullying someone into saying, well, that's how, that's how we think you should think like us. Instead, you're, you're sort of challenging and saying, well, here's the idea. What do you think? Is it, you know, doesn't that make sense to do that? What would you do? You know? So I think in that way, it's actually rather, it's a light, I don't want to say it's light reading, but 
it's easily accepted by the brain, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, and that's the technique. And uh, I'll uh, reveal a little bit of the technique. I don't want to give too much away because if you can see too much under the hood, it, it ruins the experience. But one of the two characters, the one who is not the smartest person in the universe, plays the role of pacing. Uh, in hypnosis, pacing means matching somebody. So you can match their breathing, their their body language, their form of speaking. You can match them in any way. And if you do that, it, it softens them up, if you will, for ideas that maybe they don't agree with. But once you've paced them, they're more likely to accept them because you become sort of linked or bonded, you know, more trusted, even irrationally so. So I have the character saying the things that I know the reader is going to say as they think them. So as the smartest person in the world says something, and I realize that anybody who hears that for the first time is going to say, yeah, but, and I know what that but is going to be. Mm -hmm. I have my character say that, yeah, but. And then the reader says, oh yeah, that's just what I was going to ask. And that's one of the ways you ease them into the, the scene. They, they go in through that character and then it becomes, you know, they become part of the, the scenery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if the reality is questioned in the same way that they would question it, then they think that the author is also thinking in those terms. Yeah, it binds them to me as an author, but also to the character and to the book. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad you answered that. I think I just thought it was a very interesting book. And again, I'm fascinated by the whole dual brain thing being being um, accused of being that way and, and having... Um, written both fiction and nonfiction, people ask, well, how do you do both? And I think, well, I think everyone can do both. It depends on what you focus on. And when I saw that you wrote that, and I saw that your your books are also kind of a combination of the humor, but also some very serious things, if you think about it, I just, I'm just fascinated by the whole process and how people sort of switch from A to B and maybe A and B are just together. Yeah, there, you're uh, certainly right that uh, writing fiction and nonfiction are really, really different. I think my brain is maybe more optimized to nonfiction, uh, which includes humor. I mean, humor can be fiction all, but uh, I usually based on based on some kind of reality. So yeah, um, it it took me some work to figure out how to write fiction because I don't read it, I don't consume it. So I didn't know what it was supposed to look like. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. I uh, that's exactly what what I I wrote four nonfictions, and then I said I'm done. I need to let these things do what they're supposed to do, and I'm terrible at marketing. I'm absolutely horrible. And then and then that lasted two weeks, and then I wrote a fiction, <laughs> and I thought, well, and it was such a different experience in writing one versus the other because one is a very way of just sort of it, it's a way of structuring thoughts in a way that you think is this a sub thought of this and so on and so forth? Do they need to learn this before they learn this? And then with the fiction, it, it was just such a, a different ethereal thing that seems to come out of nowhere. Yeah, I would say with nonfiction, persuasion is the primary thing I'm thinking about when I'm writing it, because mm -hmm. I want people to be persuaded that what I'm writing is important and, you know, and they understand it. Uh, when I'm writing fiction, I'm writing to a feeling. So I, I want you to experience something. I want you to get goosebumps. I want your heart to race. I want you to be curious. So it's all about evoking uh, feelings versus persuasion. Wow. That's, that's, yes. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I wholeheartedly agree. Your, um, your Periscope, and your Periscope's also on YouTube, correct? You also have them. They also end up on YouTube. Yeah, so we posted about an hour later, usually on YouTube. So it's right. replayed there, and they're and they're typically in the, in the morning. And you do something called the simultaneous sip, in which it's something you do that everyone gets to drink their coffee or whatever beverage they have at the time. Yeah, that's also a hypnosis trick. But everybody who's watching the Periscope is in on it. You know, right. everybody knows that it's a hypnosis trick, and and that is part of the fun. And I, I did a little event, a public event yesterday. And people were coming up to me telling me how much they enjoyed the simultaneous sip. So they, they liked the Periscope, but they would always mention, you know, at first I didn't think I was going to do a sip at the same time you were <laughs> sipping your coffee. But then I just found myself doing it. And then I found I liked it more. And so now, now my you know, boyfriend or girlfriend and I do it every morning together and we do the simultaneous sip. Right. Now that's, 
that of course is completely intentional on my part. Mm-hmm. And the, the technique is as follows. If, if you can get somebody to do something that has a reward, they're more likely to do more of it. And coffee tastes good and it's sort of a reward. And when I tell them everybody's doing it around the world at the same time, they feel connected to something, Mm -hmm. they're part of something. And then from there, it's just repetition and simplicity. There's nothing more simple than picking up a, you know, a cup and taking a sip. And I keep repeating it and telling people it's going to make their dopamine surge and it's the best part of the day. (laughs) And even though people see that language as just sort of uh, empty introductory stuff, you know, just something you say before you take the sip. It's all designed. So when I tell them they will enjoy it, it will stoke their dopamine, it will make the rest of the day better. The first time you hear it, it doesn't have much effect, you know, if you just hear it once. But most of my uh, followers are there every day. (laughs) And so if you hear that every day, that beverage is going to start tasting better. And for some people, they will imagine that if they miss it, their day doesn't go as well. Uh, I've heard of that as well. I like to so believe that. It's a pretty pretty powerful technique, but it's fully disclosed. I'm, I'm not fooling anybody. They all know why I do it, and, and that's part of the fun. And it, yeah, and it, it doesn't incorporate something else that I think, I, I swear I, I read a tweet that you said a long time ago, and that if you can connect something to an additional sense, so in other words, if you're connecting people watching you with the taste of something pleasant, so if you can connect that, something can have an even bigger impact. And I, yeah. think, it might, I think it might have even been your comment on one of the president's tweets, and you said this is brilliant because he's connecting this with this feeling of, of, this, of this vision or this look or something. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, and I wish I had I thought, to, thought to mention it. But yeah, if, if you can make somebody uh, imagine that they can see something, that's more persuasive. You know, even if you're just describing it in words, if they can imagine it, that's more powerful. If you can make them smell it, hear it, or have any kind of memory of a sense, you know, uh, describe it as a touch, you know, something's you know, soft and warm. Uh, if you get it more senses involved, people get more engaged. And if they're more engaged with the content, they're more likely to be persuaded or to like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely feel that. I definitely think it's a, it's a, it's a nifty idea. And I will admit to you though, once one of the sips was soup. So I know you say a vessel of any kind. So I know I, I'm, I'm good on that. <laughs> yeah, you're all set. <laughs> well, thank you for approving. Uh, it, can, may I ask you? You're talking. You touched a couple, uh, touched on persuasion, and then we've talked about tweets and. And the president, you, you've made a statement that like, you feel that the president is one of the most persuasive people that you've ever witnessed. Yes. And that uh, you, I, I had read that you had also had, uh, in, in some of the things that you had talked about online, uh, it sort of affected your income. Do you, did, you, did you want to mention that or, or, or sort of respond to that and, and, and tell people what, what happened? Yeah, when when I write and talk about the president, I'm usually talking more about technique and persuasion, uh, not so much policies. Mm-hmm. But because I say good things about him, it kind of automatically puts me on that team, whether whether I thought I belonged there or not. And so I've sort of embraced that. But he he is the most uh, persuasive person that I've ever seen in in person, you know, or or on TV, etc. Uh, part of it is he has a higher risk profile than the average person. You know, if, if you took away his risk profile, I'd say somebody like, I don't know, Tony Robbins would be the most persuasive person in the world. But Tony sort of plays it uh, down the middle. You mm-hmm. know, he, he's not he's not provoking you. He's not causing trouble. Whereas Trump doesn't mind doing any of those things. <laughs> so there, there's no rule he won't break. There's no boundary he won't push. And the net effect of that is that literally everything he does is interesting. He, he can't be uninteresting. I, I don't know if he could do it if he tried. <laughs> and you compare that to, say, Mike Bloomberg, who did his little announcement, and you could barely keep your eyes open. Well, I will do good things for the LGBTQ community. And you, know, and you just fall asleep. So what, the magic of what Trump does is that he's so good at controlling attention and keeping things simple and repeating them, build the wall, build the wall, build the wall, 
uh, that the net effect is that he's the most persuasive person I've ever seen, technique wise. And I, and I do think it's absolutely fascinating seeing you sort of not so much critique, but you sort of review his tweets and other people's tweets. And you say, this is an example of this. This is an example of that. Yeah. And uh, I just realized I didn't answer your question. It was about the, uh, the impact on my, uh, my finances. So my, <laughs> my income dropped by about a third as soon as people started identifying me with talking about uh, Trump's talent stack. And, you know, obviously I lost most of my friends who leaned the other direction. They, they just couldn't stand being in the room with anybody who could say anything good about that monster. So it's, it's a weird amped up world where people are far more excited than they should be about topics. And part of that is the president makes people's hair catch on fire just by the way he does and says things. So we, we live in a, in a, in a cranked up world and it's, it's bad if you don't know that it's artificial. So I try to remind people that, no, the reason you feel so strongly about this is that the business model of the press ha has driven toward more provocative stuff. Mm -hmm. So years ago, it would just been the news would have been presented to you completely down the middle. You'd say, okay, that's interesting. Moving on. But today, almost every story is couched in terms of us versus them, winners and losers, you know, somebody's going to take your money. And <laughs> so very everything's, everything's dangerous now. Mm -hmm. there, there's no such thing as uh, an innocent comment. Every comment is dangerous. It's going to cause people to respect us less and our allies will never deal with us anymore. And, you know, every, everything's got this big imagined ripple effect that probably doesn't exist. Right. And you, t you talk about that in the book as well. This, uh, the, the discussion we just had about the news, you mentioned that in the book as well. Yeah, so the moment, uh, the moment we were able to measure with precision what people were clicking on and who they were and why they were clicking, everything was broken from that point on. Because as soon as you knew what people clicked on, you had to provide more of it. And it turns out that boring news with, with no bias doesn't really get that many clicks. People, people want the fight. They want the drama. They want the show. And so you get more of those, those types of uh, articles and, and content until people, everybody's just uh, ready to fight because they've been so primed by all this content that is way more provocative and you know, dangerous sounding than it might have been even a few years ago. Yeah, it's, 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 an, it's amazing. It's, it's, the amount of energy that's put into that is just is crazy. Yeah, I would say that we fully transitioned, too, from, uh, do you remember when you could go to the movies and there'd be like a, a funny movie and you'd watch the movie and you'd laugh and you'd come home and you'd say, that was a good, funny movie. But you may have noticed that people can't make funny movies anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not even a thing, right. you know, except maybe kid movies. But uh, between the sensitivity of who's going to get offended, that's part of it. But I think another part is that uh, reality has become the new comedy. And even comedians who are doing well, they do well by talking about real things. You know, I mean, you know, Chappelle is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks about real things and real, the real way people feel about stuff. And uh, that's, that's very powerful. I think that the way that the, the movies are created is, is so different than let's say the eighties. In fact, it was, it was very interesting with my, when my kids were, were younger, we, I'd show them an eighties movie and then another eighties movie. And they'd say, why are these so good? <laughs> I'd say, this is because this is the way the, the movies used to be. They were, they weren't afraid to say certain things. And I remember, I remember my kids were fairly young and we watched midnight run and that's where they sort of learned all about the F word. And I thought, well, you're going to learn it here versus on a bus. <laughs> it's going to take all the power away. And they just thought it was hilarious. Yeah, for a while I was hooked on old Hitchcock movies, and I realized that the reason I liked them so much is that they didn't have any filler, and they, they'd be a, you know a tight hour and a half with a with a good little mystery in it, and good characters, and that was pretty entertaining. But now in the world of you know giant movies and directors who can force the studio to take their three hour movie without being edited, 
uh, we, we've just sort of devolved into it's all car chases and somebody's tied to a chair to be tortured. And it's really just the same movie over and over again. Right. And it's long, long form storytelling has sort of gotten out of out of hand where I think yeah, people we, want. Oh, yeah, our, our attention span is just getting shorter and shorter because social media and all the, the quick hits are so entertaining. They're so much fun. Mm-hmm. You know, a good tweet can entertain me as much as half an hour of a of a sitcom on television. <laughs> Especially one with a little tiny video attached. Just 10 seconds of, of a reaction. And that's also today is like, I, I, it, I find myself watching these and I just think I'm something wrong with me is that I actually enjoy some reaction videos sometimes. And I think all I'm doing is watching a person react to a screen. <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the little gifs or gifs, however, whichever way you want to call it. Right. Uh, uh, of people being shocked and, and falling over and stuff. I, I, they always work for me. I laugh every time I see them. And I, I think it's a human nature thing because, you know, faces is all that really matters to us. And, that, you know, at the end of the day, it's just basically faces and, and how the faces are, uh, the emotion shown in the face. So they literally have these reaction videos in which someone watches a movie trailer and then they get a million hits because someone saw someone look surprised at what happens in a trailer. Right. You know, I've sometimes hypothesized, I've never taken this anywhere, but so you'll you'll be hearing it for the first time, that the reason that some companies such as um, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, that the reason they succeed is because they emphasize faces, just as you were saying, and that if you ask the, the business community, all right, why does this work and this one doesn't, they either wouldn't know, or they'd say it's some kind of X factor, or they'd say... Well, you know, people want to share their, you know, food they ate on social media or whatever. But I, I think it might be simpler. Mm-hmm. I think we're so drawn naturally to human faces that FaceTime was literally a whole bunch of faces. And then Instagram was, let's get rid of all the, you know, all the external stuff and we'll just show you a bunch of faces and bodies too. And, and Twitter it has the same quality that if you include a, a photo with your tweet, especially if there's a human in that photo, you're going to get way more engagement. It just goes, it's a, it's a 10 to one compared to just text. Yes. And, and if the face is a female, regardless of if the audience is male or female, that will also make a greater impact. And wherever the face is looking is where people are typically going to look for the information because that face likes it and the face is looking at it. So, and and I found out a lot of that stuff too, when I actually built a dating site from scratch. So I actually looked at all the dating sites and they were all essentially the same. They showed you a small picture of a person's face and regardless of what the profile said or what the person's name was or any of their attributes, it was whether you liked that face or not. Yeah. We're here's a little experiment for you. If, if you uh, look at any kind of a website that has tiny, tiny little thumbnails, Let, let's say the profile pictures on Twitter are just tiny little smudges that you can barely see the face. You know, they're so small mm-hmm. and still, still you can tell who's attractive. Yes. Yes. <laughs> both both male and female. So with you know only twenty percent as much information as you should need to determine if a person looks attractive or not, you can tell, and you can tell every time from just that little tiny smudge. Right. So that's that's how tuned in we are to faces. Exactly. We are. We have. We have evolved to, to literally. You can you can go into a room, and I talk about this too. You go into a room, let's say Starbucks or whatever, and you're single. You can survey that room in a matter of seconds and decide whether you think any of those people are attractive to you or not. And that takes a tremendous amount of processing. It's it's a it's an algorithm that we all have that that we just figure that out. And, and and it's so quick. It's one of the things that we have a lot of processing power for is deciding that a face is attractive or not. Yeah, I can tell you from my own experience that all of my major relationships were uh, sort of love at first sight types where there was something about just looking into a person's face where I'd say, okay, here's my future. You know, the, the, this is, this is the, the big thing. And I can tell in the first 10 seconds. Yep. I, I would concur with that. And I think, and there are studies that show that it depends on like how far away someone's eyes are, are apart. And that affects you because some people may need it to be a certain way. Some people, others, it's the friendliness of the mouth, all that stuff. It's, it's absolutely applicable. Well, uh, there's something I learned about recently. It's called the the golden ratio, I think. Oh yes, 
and it has something to do with the exact position of your, your eyes and mouth and nose and stuff. And apparently there's some formula of ratio of, you know, distances or whatever that is universally considered attractive. Mm -hmm. And, and software can actually pick those people out because, you know, the same way you could do uh, facial recognition on your phone, uh, it can tell you if you're, if you're attractive according to the golden ratio or not. I I have not, uh, I've not tested it on myself. I don't want to know that I'm a trapezoid or, or something. So I think I fit in the parallelogram. And so that's why I have a face for radio, which is why we're just talking. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect for us. <laughs> is there anything else that you would like to uh, shout out about, about the book or your, or your Periscope before we go? Because I, I promised you an hour and I don't want to take up any more time than I promised. Well, if anybody's looking for any of my content, a good place to start is either Dilbert.com, if you like the comics, or... Uh, Scott Adams says all one word, uh, just on Twitter or Periscope. And those are good places to find me and they'll have, you can also just Google me and you'll find me on, on YouTube and, and I'm, I'm all over the press this month because of the, the book launch. So you can, you can find about a hundred articles about me that are all fresh. Yeah, and, and if people do follow you on Twitter, they certainly, they'll get their money's worth. <laughs> I, I shouldn't know, say I, it that I, way because it's free, but it, yeah, you know, not everybody uses it the same way, of course, but I use Twitter like it's my own private TV channel. And so when I tweet, I'm trying to tweet something that other people will enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that's gotten me 360,000 followers so far, so it seems to be working. And, it, it, and speaking of your own private channel, uh, that's sort of what, what Periscope is too, and I think that's the new face of what, what TV is versus Versus, you know, leaning, it's, it's more lean forward than lean back now. So instead of being lean back and saying, oh, it's seven o'clock, that thing is on. It's, I can get Scott Adams on demand because his Periscope's on now. Yeah, you know, I, I've noticed that 99% of people who use Periscope use it backwards, which is they'll turn it on and then they'll just sit there reading the comments on the screen. So they're, <laughs> they're, letting, they're letting the audience entertain them while they're just sitting there. And and I think no, you have that backwards. They're they're tuning in to watch you do something, so you better do something. So that's the way I I try to do it. I try to pack it with content and uh, by using the comments as well as part of that. And you do use the comments, and you use that, and you put a lot of effort into using the comments in a way that you're not just staring and reading and going, "Where's my glasses?" You you actually try to read as rapidly as you can and res respond to that. I've seen many many a broadcast in which someone's pauses for 30 seconds to read something and i think the action just really slows down yeah yeah the the uh, one of the big tricks of entertainment is that your sense of time and the audience's sense of time might be different and, and you have to adjust for the audience's sense of time and if the audience has to wait three seconds for the next thing to happen they're getting a little restless <laughs> so i try to make sure they don't have to wait Right. And I think that's the same way in, in podcasts as well with, uh, with pauses in between. Right. Well, so that we have no more pauses, I'm going to um, thank you so much for spending an hour with me. I think this was just absolutely fantastic. I really enjoyed the chat and I really enjoyed you going over the things in the book. And I will say to people that they absolutely need to, to go out and, and grab Loser Think and take a look at your other books. If, if they've never read any of your books, they really, really need to catch up because Loser Think's a great one. Uh, the How to Fail at Everything is a really fantastic one as well. They have stories in them that people can relate to, but they're not rambling thoughts. They're, they're, they actually have a structure and they touch on a lot of the things that, that people will see if they follow you on Twitter or they watch the, the Periscope. Well, thank you for saying that. And I, I would also like to add that you're really good at this. Your, your questions are unusually insightful. So I, I was able to enjoy this where sometimes it's work, but uh, this time it wasn't. So thank you for that. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, have, a, have a great Thanksgiving. And, um, and maybe we'll, we'll chat again when, when the next book comes out. I'd love to. Thanks awesome. so much for having me. Thank you, sir. Hey there. Thank you for listening. I'm really grateful that you did that. If you like the episode or you like the podcast in general, I would love for you to rate it. That kind of feedback really helps me 
to know which direction I should be going, what I can improve on, and so forth. I would like to alert you to my latest book. It's called The Sword and the Sunflower. Check it out on Amazon, and I'll talk to you next time.